just um, share some housekeeping items. Like if you can just share the next slide. Um, so you can ask questions uh, at any time. There is Q&A tab. Uh, we will probably address the questions at the end, uh, but um, if it's something that you want to address during the discussion, feel free to do that as well. Will be recorded. Uh, a lot of people reach out to ask that before the actual event. Um, and please, if at any moment uh, you're having any difficulties with Zoom or anything, feel free to reach out to either me or Zach. This is the framework for discussion. We'll try to cover most of these questions today as much as the time will allow. Um, but um, before we get to those questions, uh, I would like to thank you all of you again, and just to share that we felt that there is no better way to kick off the new year than to invite three database experts to share the, their thoughts on what are the trends in the database space for the upcoming year and beyond. And with us today are Nikita Shangunov of Neon Database, uh, Ryan Boyd of Mother Duck, and Yingjun Wu of Rising Wave. Um, so before we move to the questions, would you mind like briefly introducing yourself, like telling us what you're building and how your product fits in the wider database ecosystem? So maybe Nikita, you want to start first? Yeah, of course. Uh, first of all, happy to be here. My name is Nikita uh, and I'm the CEO of Neon. Uh, Neon is focusing on the OLTP space uh, by offering the serverless Postgres platform. And the idea behind the company was very, very simple. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, uh, the, the databases today, um, the dominant OLTP database, and I know this very well because um, you know previously I started a company with Single Store, um, and it's a that's a company the Single Store is a company at scale now north of hundred million in revenue, but um, um, Single Store competes both in the analytics and in the OLTP space, and through that lens um, I saw the rise of Postgres very very clearly. Um, so so despite all the innovation in the database space in OLTP developers choose Postgres, which is a 30 year old technology. Um, and so um, I, I asked myself a question of, can we make that platform incredibly modern and what this, and what this means um, with the idea that if we do a good job, we can roll up all Postgres consumption in the world onto the Neon platform. And um, if we do that, that basically means winning in OLTP, and that's a, a gigantic market. So, so that's the idea behind me. And the way, um, kind of the product innovation that that we put uh, into Neon is serverless. Um, it's actually quite tricky to take a legacy system like Postgres that is meant to run in a in a single node uh, to make it serverless. And then uh, the other thing that we observe that developers. Um, they don't just use the database to run their app. They actively develop the app and change the app. And there's this application development lifecycle that exists there. And all the other developer systems and developer platforms embrace the developer lifecycle and databases have not. And so we're changing that. And then um, hopefully I'll have an opportunity to, to talk a bit more about it. Well, thank you, Nikita. Ryan, can you go next? Yes. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, I'm Ryan Boyd, co-founder at Mother Duck. And Mother Duck was created, you know, based off of looking at what the trends we see in the database world that other people haven't realized yet. Um, and one of those trends is really uh, the first question that we'll get to uh, around big data is dead. Uh, we, we basically saw that the need for distributed compute uh, has dramatically decreased. Um, I won't go so far as, as calling it dead. There, it is a hyperbole for a reason. Uh, but the need for, for you know, large scale distributed compute has, has decreased. The need for simplicity has increased over time. And so Mother Duck uh, was created around DuckDB to say, how can you take your DuckDB 
and run it as an analytics platform uh, in the cloud. And uh, we're getting a lot of excitement around that. People love the, the developer usability of DuckDB. Uh, and we try to extend that to the cloud to provide things like sharing and to provide things like collaboration and central storage and catalog management. Uh, largely, you know, this is comes into two different ways that people use our product. One is is as a data warehouse for their organization to be that central data store. And then the second is to, as a backend for data applications. So for people who are building SaaS applications that want to surface users and data to them. Um, and we're just seeing a lot of excitement. Um, we are launched last June and then in September opened it up for everyone. Um, and uh, we've just been on a roll and doing lots of interesting things around um, hybrid is probably the biggest uh, area of innovation, which is how do we use our local laptop in combination with the cloud uh, and have those work seamlessly together. So thank you. Looking forward to the chat. Excellent. Andrew? Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm the founder of uh, Reading Wave Labs. Reading Wave is a streaming database. Basically, we do stream processing. And before starting on the company, I was at uh, AWS Redshift, which is the data warehouse, right, doing OLAP. And the prior to that, I was at Academia. I was in uh, IBM Research Hubbardton. Uh, and uh, also from the, I obtained my PhD. Um, but well, during my uh, during my days well, in academia, I was working on ORTP. So essentially, I have the background about both ORTP and OLAP. I feel that, okay, well, there are definitely a lot of vendors and there are a lot of exciting uh, movement there. But essentially, I feel that okay, in the stream processing space, there are pretty limited um, systems, well, right? Well, and probably not not many systems, right? Probably you can mention Apache Spark streaming. Probably you can mention um, uh, Flink, right? But there are not many other solutions, and most of the existing solutions are kind of like expensive or uh, yeah, all could be kind of difficult to use. So I totally agree that we should. In this year's, I mean, we should, if we want to build a database system, we should focus on simplicity and cost efficiency. And that's why we build a company on a system called Writing Wave. Yeah, that's about fine. Yeah. Thanks, Kim Jung. So let's kick off the discussion, the debate part with this controversial claim is big data really that? And how it's impacting uh, the development of databases? Ryan, want to start? Sure. I mean, so the the basic thing is our industry works in cycles and uh, sometimes it takes us a while to adapt. So, you know, I worked on Google BigQuery in 2012, uh, along with some other folks on our team. And it in 2012, you know, the max size of, of memory on an EC2 machine um was what 60 gigs of ram um nowadays the max size of, of memory on an ec2 machine is 25 terabytes the 400x difference uh similarly if you just even look at laptops the largest macbook pro was eight gigs of ram nowadays it's 96 gigs and i actually think it might have gone up since then uh since i took those numbers but so you know hardware has changed dramatically uh, and our software has not really changed. We we basically shunned as an industry the people that are doing scale up versus scale out. I experienced that a lot uh, at Neo Four J, uh, which really tried to push the idea that you could scale up the uh, your graph databases and didn't need distributed graphs. Um, but people didn't buy it in their in their uh, RFP processes and such. Um, the nowadays though, this really is, is true. We can, we can scale up a single machine and make it fantastically powerful to process loads that were much bigger than we could process 10 years ago. Um, and so, you know, when we say big data is dead, uh, what we mean is that, you know, the, the compute power has changed a lot, uh, over the years data that is useful 
has not grown that much. You're still analyzing data from last week, last month, uh, maybe the last quarter. You're only analyzing a small subset of your data. Um, and, you know, combine all of these things together. And what you look at is 95% of the companies out there uh, don't really need, you know, the petabyte scale architectures that we're building in Silicon Valley. And I liked, I mean, you know, I'm an engineer, I like uh, problem solving, I like innovation, but I think that, you know, our our engineers and in, in Silicon Valley have been focused really on this scale that no one has, uh, and instead should be focused on the simplicity of data, making it an easier, better user experience. Um, and, you know, that's really kind of one of the core philosophies of our company. Your and, thoughts, Nikita. Uh, and uh, just got a follow-up question, uh, uh, if I may. Sure. So, so do you think um, do, do you think we're gonna shrink the amount of data that people actually store? You know, uh, no. uh, or or that is still gonna be a, a trend that is kind of growing. I I think that's gonna. I think people are gonna store the data. The question is, how much of that data are they going to analyze on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, you know, people aren't going to want to throw away data. <laughs> like, um, and, you know, we all, but it's, you know, it's similar to my garage, right? Like, uh, I store a lot of things in my garage. How often do I use that? How often do I pull out, you know, the, the you know, USB-A to whatever strange square USB cord from 30 years ago? Uh, not 30, but, you know, you get the point, um, you know, so I, I think we'll store it. I won't necessarily think that many companies will use it. Those companies that do use it will still be looking at slices of that data. So it needs to be organized. I get that. Yeah, but in DuckDB, do you really store data in S3? Probably not, right? Uh, you can, you can, absolutely. So, you know, one of the, the key things that people really love about DuckDB is its ability to access data from anywhere in any format. So, you know, DuckDB, like, you know, one of the, the strong innovations in DuckDB was a CSV parser, which sounds laughable, but CSV still remains the lowest common denominator format that a lot of people store. Um, but yeah, it can read Parquet files, can read Iceberg files, can read CSV. Um, and so people can use it as a query engine for a lake house. Um, but, you know, for optimal performance, yes, we still uh, believe that bringing the data into DuckDB is valuable. But I think it's fine if, you're, if your archive uh, in some ways is, is out there on, on S3. Okay. Any thoughts, Nikita Yingjun, on this, or we can move to the next question. Uh, we, we we should uh, lots of thoughts, but let's just move. Uh, <laughs> and we can wrap up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the chat is already like filling with questions, so at some point we'll just like make a break and address those. So last year we had another panel where like the the issue of S3 Express and how it impacts data infra was uh, discussed a lot. So my question is like how, for example, S3 Express will affect cloud OLTPs data design. Um, maybe Nikita, you can start with that. And like if shared storage architecture will be like a growing trend with the adoption of S3 Express. Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, we we started working on Ian before S3 Express showed up. And because of that, we had to build a super low latency tier uh, that is responsible for both persisting the transaction log that Postgres called wall, right ahead log. And uh, we, we created a super low latency tier that serves individual pages um, you know, Postgres needs eight kilobyte pages. So, so we build this low latency, latency tier. We call this page servers. The system that per persists along, we call safe keepers. And that safe keeper thing that for anybody on the call, think about it kind of like Kafka, right? So it's a, it's basically a persistent message queue and um, it, it, it stores the transaction log and it can stream the transaction log into where we wanted to stream the transaction log. 
For example, when we stand up a, the, a read replica, we can have safekeepers stream the transaction log to the read replicas, so the read replicas can invalidate their caches. So um, now, if when we started this thing, let's say um, S3 Express existed, what we would do, we would perform a lot of testing to understand which parts of the system we didn't have to build. Now, we still want the, 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 the safekeeper thingy to, to be more than just a fast object store because it has additional functionality by not only persisting the stream of data, but also broadcasting that data to the places that where we need to uh, uh, go. And potentially that architecture would be, would be different. Um, and so unfortunately my answer to, like my precise answer to this question, I don't know. S3 Express showed up and, and our infrastructure is already built uh, and it hides the, the high latencies of S3 because we have that low latency storage tier which you know we put like a ton of engineering into. Um, I think having S3 Express, there is a blog post from somebody who works for Confluent, uh, Jack, I think I'm, I'm trying to remember, um, who, who, who dives deep into the properties of S3 Express. So I would, I would go and dig that out. Um, my intuition that S3 Express is not enough because you can't just put an LLTP system on top of these things anyway. Uh, you know, despite the speed, it still doesn't like small objects. Um, and in the world of OLTP databases, you have a lot of small pieces of data that you interact with this low latency storage. So, so that is my hunch, but unfortunately a super precise answer to this question, I don't have on this call. Brian, Yingjun. So actually, actually for us, for we are building stream processing systems. So essentially people know that, okay, I mean, the most challenging thing in the stream processing system is to match the internal states. And we actually different from the other stream processing systems. We actually put a state, persist a state in the S3. So before S3 Express emerged, well, what do we do with as well? And that's essentially what our existing system looks like. We actually have a caching layer in EC2, so that key okay, most of the most of the state access will hit into the S3 cache. Oh, sorry, not the S3 cache, the, the cache in EC2. But if you uh, come from the cache miss, you will have to touch the data in S3, which will cause high latency. But because of the S3 Express thing, I think I believe that okay, it can definitely mitigate the problem. But I don't really think that S3 will change Express will change the architecture. Because well, anyways, well, at least well, uh, to our case, well, in our case, well, or probably in our TB case, we still want to maintain the cache in the local system, and we still want to make sure that okay, the response time is low enough. But the different thing here that okay, we do not really care too much about about do a lot of optimizations about okay, how or what will happen if the cache miss occurred, right? Because well, S three's latency is S three's express latency is should be low enough. I didn't really see any third party benchmark, but I believe that okay, it's definitely being, uh, yeah, going to be lower than, than the normal S3. Yeah, that's my, my answer. Yeah, I, th I think the, you know, this is just another step on kind of what we're seeing in innovation in the data space that I think will make easier to build systems like us. Like Nikita, you know, we build our own layer uh, that handles, you know, the in-between uh, you know, going to S3, but, uh, you know, it also emphasizes kind of the focus on latency, uh, and explain, as, as, especially in the exploratory analytics space, uh, we think that latency is, is actually really important. Uh, we think that it, you know, we want users to be able to adjust their dashboards, uh, and I won't name specific products here, but like in a past job, you know, I'd, I'd adjust a, a slider in a in a BI dashboard, and I'd wait thirty seconds. Like th this is not a way to work, right? So, uh, you know, I think that they're heading the right direction by reducing latency. Um, we we also have you know ways that we're trying to reduce latency with that hybrid functionality of bringing some of the data to your local machine. Uh, and I think this will just be a general director direction for improving experience that we'll we'll get. Um, we also 
you know, think for instance that S3, um, you know, e egress costs and things like that are actually a blocker to some innovation right now. And uh, so that's like another, another level that we're looking forward to seeing some change on uh, to allow, you know, data to move freely, uh, you know, through out of S3 to the local machines. Ryan, I, I think you're bringing a, a fantastic point. Um, and some of that I just want to amplify. So, so first of all, latency matters. And what uh, in the analytics world, uh, you know, we're talking about 30 seconds. We actually using, you know, Superset and Snowflake internally at Neon. And um, I don't love the latencies, uh, like at all. Um, and we, to, to, to Ryan's point, we don't have that much data, right? We don't have petabytes of data, uh, but the refresh is, is annoyingly slow. And I think it's annoyingly slow is um, either because of S3, because at the end of the day, the source of data is S3 uh, on Snowflake, or it's because there's like, you know, layers of systems, uh, you know, query optimization happens, uh, you know, for every query and stuff like that. So in the analytics world, I want the latency to be in the moment. Ideally, that is hundreds of milliseconds. Um, and then I would be kind of happy. In the OLTP world, the the latency has a completely different meaning, and um, what what's happening in the industry now uh, across application development that that we're starting to finally obsess about um, about end to end latency in our applications. So if if you use if you have a static website and you put a static website on a system like Vercel. This thing will start loading in tens of milliseconds, low tens of milliseconds. And that's addicting, right? That's that's what good user experience is. Um, now, the other thing that is happening with the platforms like Vercel, with the platforms like Cloudflare Workers, then, then, then our applications don't run um, in the same way in they used to. They don't run in, in a VM or in a Kubernetes environment. They run in the serverless environment, and they're driven by uh, frameworks like Next.js, which splits up code that runs in the browser and the code that runs, quote unquote, in on the edge. And edge is one of the twenty, like the closest data center to you. It could be one of the AWS regions. So the distance between you and the closest AWS region is probably you know sub ten milliseconds. Now, from there, your and that's where your application code runs. From there, it queries the database. So now that latency is something that we obsess about as well. And because all of that contributes to the end-to-end -end latency uh, of the user experience. And, and it's it's true for LTP, it's true for all app. The numbers are different, right? In you know, for LTP, you need to be, you know, low tens of milliseconds. Uh, for for all up ideally low hundreds of milliseconds, but nonetheless that is is super key and and that makes me super excited that that the industry now is focusing on that more than it's focusing on throughput because uh, that's the unsolved problem of today. Thanks, Nikita. Yeah, absolutely. Think entirely different, but I have to ask you. 2023 was all about vector databases. What do you think will happen? This year, right. is it going to be a plugin or dedicated service? Architecture-wise, will Neon, Mother Duck, and Rising Wave add vector search functionalities? Yeah, it would be great question. Definitely a plugin, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. first of all, we'll have both. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you, you know, Quadrant just raised around uh, twenty-eight million dollars, I think, from Spark Capital. Uh, congratulations to the Quadrant team. I think that's one of the better ones uh, that are out there in the market and it's open source and it's written in Rust. Uh, thought that Rust matters, um, but I still um, uh, think that this is this is a great choice. Um, I think um, when, when you look at the um, functionality of vector databases today, um, they did not diverge far enough from, from plugins and implementations of vector databases as a feature. So, for example, when when we look at um, you know, and of course, Motherduck and, and Ian will have their own point of view. So we are incredibly biased here in, in that question. Um, so, uh, 
are we going to have this as a feature? We have this as a feature. <laughs> so like, it's not about going to or not going to. We have it. It's called PG Vector. Um, and uh, we will be announcing um, uh, um, the next advancement in that feature, which we contributed to to PG Vector at, on the NEAN team, and specifically my co-founder, Heike Linekungas, um, where um, uh, PG Vector now supports parallel index build. And what that allows you to, to do is specifically on the NEON platform, it allows you, because uh, index build for vector database is kind of slow, right? You're building that um, HNSW uh, graph. That's a compute intensive process. Uh, ideally, you want to throw more resources at the index build part, but then throw those resources away. And for serving the, the data for index lookups, you don't need as much CPU. Uh, but because Neon has, is serverless and has elastic compute, we can temporarily inflate the compute, give a lot of cores, and to uh, Ryan's point, like they're very, you know, they're multi-core, big multi-core instances now on Amazon. So you can blow up the compute, build an index, storage is separate, so uh, so you're not bottleneck on that, and then shrink the compute. Um, so so that's our approach. To, to vector databases on Neon. We support PG Vector. We love it. Um, we, we collaborate with uh, the creators of PG Vector, specifically Andrew Kane. And then um, uh, we want to be good citizens uh, here. Now to, now to your broader question is like, is this going to be a real category? Uh, is real category and, and for... Uh, uh, and are we going to have, uh, uh, you know, vendors who are over time will become public companies by building a vector database? Um, the answer to that is I don't know. Um, it feels like a feature to me right now, um, and we'll find out um, a, uh, probably in the next few years. Observing how either the market diverges and like more and more use cases coming in, more and more. Um, applications require uh, a, 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 like a super high scale vector database. And we'll find out by observing the feature requirements. If the feature requirements basically uh, have any bunch of vectors that have an index on it, I kind of tend to think that we're going to have plugins and, and, and features rather than standalone companies. If those things start to like really merge their functionality with large language models and the, the list of key features that everybody needs start to really diverge from just having an index and looking it up in the index. Then we might have an opportunity to have a, a real public company in the in, in the vector database space. So that's that's my opinion. We're watching closely. Supporting PG Vector is absolutely no regrets for us. We we should do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think what, you, what I can see here that probably 90% of the companies across the world only need PG vector or something like that. I mean, a, more like a plugin, no matter whether you use MySQL or Postgres, well, I, people probably just want to have a plugin. Mm -hmm. So what I can see here is that, okay, most of the companies care a lot about the simplicity nowadays. They care a lot about simplicity. They just don't really want to use so many systems, right? Why, why should bringing another system into my data stack, right? Well, I just probably only want to have a RTB database probably just want to have a Postgres, right? Well, if Postgres can solve the OLAP problem, then I probably don't really want to buy a Redshift or probably a Snowflake, right? But definitely uh, right at, a, at a current stage, well, it's not the case, but um, but people don't really want to make the, their data stack more complicated. But for bigger enterprise, well, what I can see here that okay, most of the enterprises, they have so many departments, right? Organizations and for every single organization, their business goals are different and their use cases are different. And they have the, they actually have the right of have the permission to choose their own solution. And if their solution is, well, their, their goal is to build a better, let's say uh, vector search application, then definitely they should purchase a dedicated vector database, but otherwise, well, why not just to use an all-in-one database system, right? That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I think we've started to see that kind of reconvergence, uh, and some of it is from a technology perspective. Um, 
and you know people saying okay yeah maybe maybe sequel we should we should still believe in sequel uh you know the no sequel movement um kind of fluttered out and a lot of a lot of folks really kind of took advantage of, of sequel as a language uh again and and i think that you know we'll continue to see that expansion contraction uh the economics right now in the venture capital world uh we'll probably see more uh uh contraction right now uh but on the vector database side the you know i think i i strongly echo the other statements that it's about simplicity and it's about the use case and it's about um you know what what additional features that that the vector database really requires I think in the end, we're always going to see specialist companies. I do think we'll have a handful of vector databases as as public companies, um, simply for the reason, the business reasons uh, that were brought up that, you know, individuals in different departments are making purchasing decisions nowadays. It's not the centralized team, you know, building this monolith in infrastructure. And there will be people that really want that. Uh, and the other business side is just for the community, right? Like the the folks that are adopting a vector database, uh, what happens with that is a community builds around that vector database and a community of like people build around that vector database. Uh, and there's a lot of lessons that people learn from each other in communities. Um, and, and I think that will actually support, you know, a, a specialized database for some use cases. But I still would say, you know, the vast majority of use cases, people have built, you know, plugins for DuckDB to do vector search. Uh, you know, we have the the PG vector on the on the Postgres side. I, I think we'll we'll see that accomplish the vast majority of these sort of centralized use cases within an organization. Um, but I don't think that that means that vector databases will disappear. Thanks, Ryan. So there will be like a lot of context switching, but there are really like some questions that uh, I would like us to cover. So my next one is how do you see the future of data analytics in terms of do you see it's like being done inside the data warehouses and data lake houses or closer to operational data uh, databases? So more specifically, what would be the difference uh, between the requirements for data warehouses and operational databases? And what are the challenges of running data analytics in operational databases? So a lot of questions to start with, but who want to tackle those? I mean, I'll, I'll say that like everything is a trade-off, right? Like this is that's that's our industry. That's what we're doing is we're deciding, you know, is there a trade-off that makes sense to achieve both uh, operational and transactional? Uh, in the same database. I don't think for the vast majority of users, there's trade-offs that are worth it there to achieve that. Um, you know, a analytics database, you know, largely we're seeing columnar formats for analytics databases um, because people tend to look at specific columns at a time. You might have a very wide table with, you know, hundreds of columns, but you care about three of the columns. Um, and on the the transactional side, you really care about a row of data at a time. And those things are just in conflict with each other in terms of how you performantly write and, and analyze data. Now, will it get to the point where storage is so fast and CPU is so fast that it doesn't matter what format your data is stored in? Possibly, but I think before we get there, we'll just improve that experience for users um, rather than, you know, to have it be the sort of 24 frame per second or 60 frame per second uh, analytics view uh, before we'll say, oh, wait, let's just scrap this idea of an analytics database and just use one, you know, HTAP database. But um, I, I think Nikita would be very good at answering this question given uh, his his background. Uh, so I'd love to hear what you have to say, Nikita. Yeah, so I think there is there are two ways to look at this. Um, and there is a way to look at this from the outside in as a user and a consumer of those services. And from the inside out as a technologist that is trying to deliver technology, you know, HTAP database that, that supports this like very wide set of requirements, right? Because on the OLTP side is system of record latency. Um, you know, this set of features 
uh, and on the analytical side is, um, you know, volume, right? And analytical data is like a thousand times bigger than transactional usually. Um, and, um, and then a different set of features, right? And they're a different set of features because they're built for different users. So the fundamentally uh, operational databases um, are, are built for uh, developers. They're building applications uh, and the important uh, properties of, of those applications, they're up 24 by seven, they require a system of record, they require low latency, and they need to support software development lifecycle. Like that's what you do. This is the set of things that you do when you build an application. And this is the set of things what you do that you run an application and you're a developer and your friends are developers and your team is, 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 is a development team that is trying to get the most, the most velocity of uh, 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 of a feature delivery out into the world, um, and 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 like data volume is not that that big of a deal for you usually because again OLTP data uh, operational data is typically one thousands of of the analytical data. The analytical systems are built for data people, for data engineers, for um, uh, for, for analytics engineers, for AI engineers. And that's the difference. Now, they do touch each other. Like those systems do touch each other. And when when they do, that's when it's like so annoying, right? Because they're different. Um, so uh, so I think for a while, they, the, those systems are going to be quite different. And they're different uh, for, for the reason they're built for different classes of users. Um, but I think what we're going to see soon, very, very, very soon, that those are going to be incredibly well integrated. And, and the reason I'm saying that is that where you put data in the modern enterprise is one of the most important decisions that you can, that you can make, right? Because data, especially analytical data, is, is huge, and it has real gravity. So if you put this data into you know, BigQuery, BigQuery versus MotherDoc versus Snowflake, versus uh, you know, uh, Data Lake, uh, Databricks, um, or versus Microsoft Fabric, um, there are a handful, Redshift for that matter, there is a handful of systems available. That is the decision that you cannot easily undo. So it's kind of a one-way door. You walk through that door and then the majority of the data, enterprise data for a larger company is there. And because that data has real gravity, then OLTP systems will gravitate to be close and around of that data. And modern systems like Iceberg will be the bridges and conduits that will connect OLTP data and, and those data lakes and data warehouses. So that I think what we're gonna see short term, and because you know data, uh, you know, databases are battles underwater in slow motion, that's like next five years. The further convergence of those systems to like true age top, um, I think we'll see some of it, but the unification of OLTP and all app world, I think is is not going to happen to us um, for the next 10 years. And 10 years is such a long time in the tech industry uh, that the whole world is, is going to change in, 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 in 10 years. So that is, that is my opinion. I think we're going to see very, very tight coupling uh, of those systems. I think the API to those systems remain different uh, um, uh, for LTP systems. There will be a lot more convergence around Postgres, and that's what we're betting on. Uh, and for all app systems, we'll have a, a, a bunch of them, and they all will evolve. Um, and then OLTP and all app will, uh, will connect via the iceberg bridge one way or another. And uh, to the end user, it's going to be very, very natural to go from OLTP to analytics and then hydrating your LTP systems um, into OLTP so you can run those apps. So I think in the future, definitely there are two words. Well, I mean, same as what we, you know, the, the world will be right now. One is the operational database world and the other one is analytical database world. So what I can see here that is think about the user journey. If I start a company, random company, the first database I will buy is an ORTB database, or operational database, right? Probably MongoDB, probably Postgres, probably MySQL. Yeah, less likely 
but but uh, I mean I will store all my data in these operational databases, and I will prob probably do all kinds of analytics inside of these databases unless until I feel that okay luck, the database doesn't really work, my SQL doesn't really work, Postgres doesn't really work, and then probably I will bring in another system that is a OLAP database system, and then that's the actually that's the time uh, that's a time point where people bring in another system and then they enter the analytical workload, uh, enter the analytical world, right? So what I can see today is that if, if you are going and join, uh, enter, enter the analytical world, then everyone is talking about, about data lake. Everyone is talking about the like, luck. Well, data warehouse is actually too expensive. We can actually store our data in S3 and in the open data lake format so that okay, all my, all my other applications can access a single set of data, right? That's the data lake. And definitely I believe that okay, in, uh, in the future, the analytical databases, uh, databases should think about okay, how they can better integrate with the data lake. Well, on the other side for the operational data warehouse, I actually, I have strong opinion on the, on the uh, so-called uh, expression, uh, no, uh, the, 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 the plugin, right? Or the Postgres plugin. So I, because what I think, I think that well, essentially Postgres is building its own ecosystem and actually it has the, let's say PG vector. Essentially we do not really need to bring so many other systems. We do not need to, temporarily we do not really need to bring in another analytical system and we can just uh, use the plugin. So definitely I think that in the future probably we'll see more and more, I mean, more like plugin systems. To the uh into the uh, into a, uh to to power people's well other other uh other customers Postgres, so that's my view. Ryan, yeah, that's that, that's interesting. The uh I I just want to emphasize the point that you said in terms of you know people will start on the transactional side. They'll start creating data before they're trying to analyze the data. Uh, and we're actually seeing that a lot with with Mother Duck uh, and with DuckDB is is people are starting on Postgres and they're starting to run their analytics queries on Postgres and they're hitting limits um, and then they're deciding what do I try do I try one of the existing you know big players in the data warehouse space uh, or do I try something else and kind of the forward leaning people uh, are who we're getting from that population and. Um, there is a need for much better integration. I think that it will come like we we actually just launched with Estuary, a CDC from Postgres to to Mother Duck. Um, and, you know, it but it should have, you know, get to the point where it's not sort of an afterthought. It doesn't come six months, nine months, you know, a year after the product is launched like it did in our case. But, you know, it is something that is kind of fundamental is recognizing that you need to get all that transactional data into uh, you know, a way that you can do analytics. So I, you know, I think the folks will, um, will continue to use transactional databases for analytics. The trans the analytics will get better in the transactional databases. I personally don't believe it will get to the point where, you know, where they're going to merge. Uh, I think, you know, everyone will eventually hit some limit um, or, you know, a large portion of the users will eventually hit a limit doing those anal analytics in a database that was designed for transactions. I do think they will like take, so for certain use cases, analytical databases will support certain transactional real-time use cases. And for certain use cases, OLTP systems will support analytical workloads, Oracle SQL Server, have column stores. Uh, Postgres doesn't. It's this is yeah. just going to change that that Postgres will have column stores. Um, Postgres will be able to query Iceberg uh, and Parquet soon ish. Um, you know, call it two three years. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can like use Postgres as a full fledged data warehouse because there's a lot more to a data warehouse than a query processor and ability to query Parquet. Yeah. I, I, and I remember I, that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I actually remember Google has a system that uh, claimed to be the HTAP system, right? What was yeah, yeah, alloy, right? But like, okay, it, yeah. it, it 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 kind of sucks at being a, a, an analytical system. You can just look at the performance of AlloyDB on TPC TPCDS or something. 
like it's kind of nowhere there um i i my foundational belief here is that this the technology problems always become people problems and are people going to be uh you know if they try to do both they're going to get distracted right and they may end up not being good at either <laughs> um and, and that i think is what we've seen in in some of the big companies like they do try to expand their foothold to you know implement these these functionalities but are are they really focused on it from all the way from the go to market people do the you know one of the big companies i've heard stories about with you know their sales people just don't understand they have such a wide variety of products that their sales people don't even understand it right and so you know if you get to that point where you're, you're trying to be one company that does it all especially with you know huge amounts of users um i just don't believe you're going to do a good job at building the the human side of it to make it work both inside the company as well as on the community side. So I don't know, it, it, it's, I'm a little bit more cynical, I guess, maybe. Yeah, I will skip some questions. Wanna go to the Postgres related ones. We already uh, mentioned some of these things. So just like curious, like, do we have a consensus here that Postgres is becoming the lingua franca for databases? And in that regard, you can also disagree. Uh, where does MySQL stand in comparison? Or yeah, more yeah. Postgres compatible. Engine, like why did you choose Postgres as their SQL standard? Uh, well, when I was a PhD, um, and I, I was working with Andy Pablo building a system called uh, Peloton, and Peloton was Postgres compatible. And for DuckDB, essentially DuckDB borrowed my, some of my code in Peloton and they built the first version of uh, DuckDB uh, using Peloton's code, which is my code. Um, but for what I found is that <laughs> Postgres just have, the, just have the gravity because for everyone just to love the, love the ecosystem. Look, well, if you go to the, let's say the, 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 the MySQL side, then what are you gonna get? Well, I mean, MySQL definitely is a standard, right? Well, but it's owned by Oracle and you probably, it's not a free world, right? Well, it's uh, still kind of like commercial product, kind of like pro a commercial product. So people like, uh, yeah, an uh, open database system, which is um, which is Postgres. And, uh, and Postgres, well, I mean, it's a 30 years, uh, as Nikita said, that's right. It's 30 year technology, right? Well, I, uh, when I was in Russia, Russia still used the Postgres 8.0, I think. Well, it's, uh, it was um, still based on the Postgres and uh, it still has super strong optimizer, probably the best optimizer in the industry. I don't know Oracle, but well, it definitely is one of the best uh, uh, optimizer you can get for free in the market. So why not just join the Postgres ecosystem, right? Well, I, I think that's quite straightforward. I, yeah, I, I think uh, there's tons of, this is a fact, right? So you can go and look DB engine ranking and then you can look Stack Overflow developer choice survey 2023. You will see the rise of Postgres for LTP. And, um, and then there is like Postgres, Postgres compatible, not Postgres. <laughs> so uh, so in, the, in the purely OLTP world, you know, there is consolidation around Postgres for a variety of reasons. I think the biggest ones are it's an open platform, right? So there's an open license. Uh, and it's a it's a platform that ships in a reliable way. So every year there's a release, just kind of like Linux. And uh, and then finally, uh, there is um, an extension ecosystem. So so now if you know there, there are no gates, like you, you know, there there's no wall into extending the system. Uh, it's uh, you can write your plugin and now you extended the engine for whichever for whatever functionality you need. you know the biggest example is like geospatial. Now um, in the analytics, I don't think that there is a consolidation around Postgres. In fact, I don't think there's any uh, right So the most popular analytical system right now is probably Snowflake uh, and like not Postgres <laughs> it's like at all. But Redshift uh, is based on Postgres. What? Redshift is based on Postgres. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's 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 a good choice. Um, but I think in analytics just doesn't matter as much, um, because the surface area is is in a way smaller, 
uh, it's, uh, you know, OLTP systems typically have procedural language, triggers, this, indexes, this, that. And so that, and analytical systems just don't have uh, those things or don't need them. Um, so, so Postgres like is not a requirement in the analytical world. And now Postgres versus MySQL, um, look, I, I think uh, the answer to that is just data, right? So go, go DB engine ranking, go stack overflow. And for the reasons that I described, I think there's more momentum now in Postgres rather than MySQL. Uh, MySQL is still more popular, by the way. It's less popular for new applications, but if you look at the overall footprint of um, you know, databases out there running, there's still more MySQL than Postgres. Um, and to my earlier point, you know, battles on the water in slow motion. This will it will take some time to 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 flip. Yeah, it's funny, like in the VC backed world, like, you know, we focus or, or we see a lot of early adopters. Uh, you know, we see a lot of people who are bleeding edge. You know, we had a survey, I think, of around 1400 uh, folks who were trying to get onto our wait list. And honestly, I don't think I saw my sequel mentioned once as part of their current uh, production stack. Uh, Postgres was mentioned all the time. Um, and the, the funny thing is, is I actually spent years building on with MySQL, uh, you know, 20 years ago or what have you. Uh, but, you know, I, I I think the openness of Postgres has made it the lingua de franca uh, of, of our industry. And then if you talk about, you know, which, which of the APIs, I think the SQL has uh, certainly benefited the analytics uh, industry. But then, you know, we've also not been afraid on the analytics side of making simpler, better SQL, making it easier for people to, um, you know, interact with their data. So, you know, even even DuckDB is sort of Postgres plus uh, plus because they pushed the boundaries on kind of ease of use uh, in, you know, just in, in their statements. Um, and so, you know, that and that has then picked up throughout other analytics you know, analytical databases have done similar. So, um, yeah, I don't think we'll see any consolidation in terms of either the SQL or the, um, you know, or the API level language uh, in the analytics side, but it's absolutely one, uh, you know, hands down in the transactional side. Injun, want to add something? Well, I think, well, no, no, I think we're well, yeah, everyone is building Postgres, uh, building on top of Postgres. But uh, but I I I do see that key, uh, yeah, definitely as I just uh, as Nikita mentioned, will definitely are still a lot of MySQL. But for new applications, what we can see here that probably eighty percent or even ninety percent of the database is up based on Postgres. That's a fact. We're running out of time. We have some questions to address here. So the first one, Nikita, if you can open Q and A tab and just take a look at the first one. Both Steve and Superbase have worked to improve the Postgres extension registry. Does Neon have any ideas regarding the Postgres extension registry? Fantastic question. Um, so first of all, we just announced the ability to, to bring your own extension into into the Neon platform. And uh, um, the next logical step would be to make this fully automatic in one click where it can go into Tempo or uh, I think Hydra announced another one or Superbase and then push a button and um, it just automatically provisions uh, into Neon. We're, um, we're looking at this, um, we, we don't, see a standard in the extension registry yet. Um, uh, but I think it's emerging. Uh, and once that's done, and I think that's soon, like, I don't know, call it a quarter or two, we will have that because it's just such a next uh, uh, logical step. Um, I think Superbase limits the number of extensions that you can have, um, and, but Tempo and uh, Hydra don't. Uh, uh, so we just need to commit to, to the one that's that's out there and we haven't made the decision which one for all three of you thank you nikita for all three of you kala wants to know what is your advice to the folks building petascale data warehouses and data lakes love to hear it perspective of all three of you from three of you petascale uh, yeah go ahead put data on s3 i guess like 
uh, and and try to use iceberg uh, uh, or, or delta parquet. I, I I go iceberg before I go delta parquet because I think that's the one the formats that's winning because that will give you the most the most flexibility. Yeah, what do we see here? That's good. Probably fifty percent of people are using um, iceberg, and probably twenty five are using probably delta delta lake, and uh, probably the others are probably using just to use JSON or CSV in S three. That's it. And so you should put that data in Data Lake and then probably find our query, query engine, right? Presto, Trino, some others, ClickHub as well, or probably DuckDB, right? Well, for sure. Yeah. So, I think the, the 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 storage side there is is the critical part uh, because I, I still don't think even they say businesses with a central data processing strategy. I don't. I don't think that that those businesses will query all of that data, but they need to store it. And and iceberg and you know S three are good choices there. So maybe you can also answer the next one, Ryan. The analyzing the amount of data will also grow not in comparison with the growth of amount of data being stored, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a central philosophy. Is people people don't analyze the last 10 years of growth in their company to try to you know build a model actually a lot of this came out with the pandemic is is people were trying to look at customer activity uh before and during the pandemic and realized wait a minute these are completely different patterns the world changes by the time that you know you need to uh analyze you know that that long period of time of data so uh, I truly believe, I mean, that the way businesses work is it's quarterly, maybe annually. That's the most that you're going to be analyzing. Um, if you analyze longer than that, it's going to be a, an extremely small slice of the data that you're looking at that, you know, you could pull it out of that, that shared storage if you really want to. Okay, I'll skip the next one. Uh, so the, the the next one, whoever wants to address it, common data lake formats are gaining a lot of tra a lot of traction to help commoditize the data storage layer. Would this mean the database layer becomes purely compute focused and less to do with storage optimizations? Well, I, I think we'll, I mean, you still need to have a database because, well, I mean, for the optional data work, uh, uh, yeah, the, the world, you still need to have database, right? Well, because, well, because well, uh, you, you cannot just store all the data in S3 because well, it's not, I mean, think about the latency, it's not slow enough, uh, it's not fast enough, right? So yeah, definitely you still need to have a optional database, but in terms of the OLAP world, yeah, I, I can see that data, as, as I just mentioned, they are grafting uh, into a data lake. So we're running out of time. We have some more questions. Uh, so probably we should leave them for the next time. Uh, I just want to thank you for uh, being with us today. This will be recorded. This will be shared. Uh, I enjoyed the discussion so much, and I hope to uh, see you again on some of our panels. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining, too. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.